Welcome to Glory Day. My name is Steve Satorsky. Uh, I think most of you know that already. Uh, I do work for the National Park Service here in Philadelphia, and a lot of locals are surprised to hear that the Park Service actually manages 22 historic sites within the city, including Gloria Day. Um, the most notable ones, of course, include the ones you would think we would manage, include, including Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell. But we also uh, take care of places like Franklin Court. I don't know if you've been there, where Ben Franklin lived. Uh, the Germantown White House in the northwest part of the city on Germantown Avenue. That's where President Washington lived for a short period of time. So there's a whole range of national park sites that we manage. And this church, of course, is unique to the National Park Service uh, for the simple reason that it's still owned and operated by the Episcopal Church, of course, the Congregation of Gloria Day. And uh, the Park Service assists as an affiliate, as we call it, uh, which simply means that we take care and manage the land that surrounds the church. So the green grass, basically, on this side of the church and on this side of the church is National Park Service property. And it was created uh, simply to help protect the church from fire uh, and also to provide a park-like setting uh, so that neighbors like you could come here and enjoy the place. Uh, whether or not you know it, the Free Library of Philadelphia, the main branch on the parkway, has an incredible historic map collection. So that's where I went to actually superimpose two original maps. They actually pull out the originals that you can look at up close, and they allowed me to copy them. And what you're looking at is a map of Southwark, which is what this neighborhood was called for many, many years. And on the right-hand side, on this side, is the 1762 map of what this area looked like. So just before the American Revolution, you could see that the area was somewhat settled. And then 80 years later, you can see how dramatically the area changed. And I'm sorry it's cut off on the bottom here, but that's an 1849 map of Southwark. And 1849 is um, five years before Southwark is incorporated into the city of Philadelphia. Another thing a lot of locals don't realize is that up until that year, the city of Philadelphia boundaries were from South Street to Vine Street, river to river. So it was actually a very small, compact area. And it took that long, basically, for the city to not only fill the area between the rivers, but of course, line the riverfront, including areas like Southwark. So I also marked on here uh, the tour route. So if you look closely at the 1849 map, uh, you'll notice right towards the riverfront, at the start point, it's actually marked number 68, if you can see that, is Gloria Day Church. And if you notice, if you cross-reference it to the 1762 map, you also see Gloria Day Church. Of course, it's been here all along. So it's marked on the map, but we are going, for our purposes today, we're going to cover uh, just about 400 years of history in less than two hours. Believe it or not, it can be done. We're only going to touch on each one of the centuries, basically. Um, but we're going to go up Swanson Street, which is right out here, once we leave the church. And then we're going to cut across Queen Street to Front Street. So if you follow the yellow line there. And then we're going to go up Front Street to a street, if you can read it, is called Mead Street. Does anybody know what that street's called today? Pemberton? No. You're close. It's water. Mm -hmm. when, the, uh, when Southwark was incorporated into the city of Philadelphia, Many of the street names changed. They wanted to have conformity throughout the city. So this is one of probably hundreds of examples. So then we're going to come down 2nd Street, and you'll probably notice um, there's a landmark building there. That is actually at the corner of Beck and 2nd Street. It was Commissioner's Hall, or the City Hall for Southwark. Of course, it's not standing anymore, but we're going to stop in that location and talk a little bit more about that. And then we're going to do a rest stop at the next church that we're going to visit, which is St. Philip Neri. So we're going to walk all along pretty quickly from stop to stop. 
and then we'll stop at St. Philip Nero. I talk about Philadelphia in the 19th century, which is a chapter of our history that's often overlooked. We tend to focus on our early history. And then we're going to do a walk through Mario Lanza Park. We're going to pass Fourth, uh, Third Street, excuse me, weave our way up through Hanson Square. And if you don't know what that is, you're about to find out. And then we're going to go to Fourth Street or Fabric Row and talk about the 20th century and the different ethnic groups that settled in this area. And we're going to end the tour in the 18th century, just like we're starting, at a place called the Shippens Inn. Until recently, it's right on Bainbridge Street, um, just beyond Famous Deli. Most people know Famous Deli. Um, Shippens Inn was a B&B &B, uh, until, I think, last year. It's been converted back into a private residence. Uh, but the house was built in the mid-18th century, so it's an original house. Um, then also in the packet, just very quickly, is a very interesting photograph, and I'm sorry, the quality isn't very good. This is taken from Shot Tower, a landmark that we'll talk about later in the tour. Uh, it's an image of Southwark in 1870. And as you can see, it's jam-packed with houses. So the area certainly was completely settled, and then some. So that's what that is. And then the other sheets of paper, uh, we have a bibliography. If I provoke your interest and you want to learn more, these are some good sources. So that's what this sheet is. When we leave the church, uh, we're going to actually refer to this old wood, wood print image, woodcut image, of uh, not only Gloria Day Church when it was a log cabin, believe it or not, that's what this is an image of, but we're going to talk about the House of Swen, the Swedish settlers who were originally here. And let's see, uh, some nasty riots took place in front of St. Philip Neri, which we're going to talk about, a famous chapter in local history. And the last handout that I have are actually a series of photographs from the early 20th century that include Fabric Row and the area immediately around that, uh, one of which is South Street. You can see very busy, crowded South Street there in the corner. Um, Part of the reason why I hand this out is so that we can compare what's changed and what hasn't. So we'll do that when we get to this spot. And then we have a couple of brochures in here. One, of course, on the church, which is where we're going to start the story, of course. And you'll be surprised to see that there's an Edgar Allan Poe brochure in here, one of the sites that the Park Service manages here in Philadelphia, but has a connection to the story. So we'll talk about that. And we're probably going to have to pick up copies of the cemetery guide before we leave here, which I think are just in the back of the church. I didn't have any at work. Uh, and we are going to stop very briefly in the cemetery at two of the tombstones to learn a little bit more about the history of this church and the congregants. So, all right, so let's start at the beginning. Actually, um, I need to go back in time, uh, predating this church, which, by the way, is the oldest church in Pennsylvania. And if you think about that for just a minute, all of the historic churches that we have, not only in this area, but in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, that's saying something, if you can claim to be the oldest. Uh, this particular building was started in 1698 and completed in 1700. And for the tricentennial celebration in the year 2000, it's hard to believe that's almost 10 years ago, uh, the church completed a major restoration uh, on the exterior, primarily on the exterior, but also on the interior. And Jeanette, if I'm not mistaken, the paint colors are historically accurate. To 1845. To 1845. And I think that's the same time period that includes the addition of the balcony. Uh, so while the interior of the church has changed over time, the building is pretty much original, uh, with the exception of two wings, very small wings on either side of the building, which Jeanette reminds me were added uh, to help reinforce the structure because the wall started to bow. So they needed to do that. Um, but the exterior of the church, uh, with the exception of the additions, is pretty accurate to the period. And the only other addition was the uh, steeple, which was added in, I think, 1801. Mm -hmm. So we're really fortunate to have the church. And I know at one point in time, 
Jeanette has told me that the congregation, and this happened throughout the city, uh, came across uh, the option of enlarging their church, building a new one, or moving. And uh, in this particular case, they decided it would be a lot cheaper to add a balcony, which I think back in the 1840s cost about $500. So uh, not only was it a smart investment, but for history, it was a very good investment because we got to preserve the church. Now, before the Swedes got here, and part of the reason why this is a National Historic Site is that almost everybody here in the city or who visits the city thinks that the local history began with who? William Penn. William Penn. Yeah, the Quakers. Well, that is our early history. You know, he did set it, settle the city in 1682. But the Swedes actually arrived and settled this area at least, what, 50 years before William Penn. So they had established a small settlement here, which resulted in a log cabin church, which I showed you a picture of, and then was replaced by what was deemed a great edifice. Even though we look at it as a small kind of quaint church today, certainly when it was completed in 1700, uh, it was very impressive structure. And it was the first structure that most ships saw as they came up the Delaware and realized they were finally in Philadelphia or very close to it. So before the Swedes, of course, the Native Americans were here for centuries. And the Lenny Lenape tribe had been here along the Delaware and throughout the Delaware Valley. And they called this area Weekako. Has anybody heard that term before or that word? Within the neighborhood, I know a playground's named after that term and several other things. Uh, anybody know what we could code translates into? The word? Pleasant place. So it's a Native American term. Uh, when William Penn ends up settling Philadelphia, he actually preserves some of the Native American names for this area. So in addition to we could co, we have uh, two townships that are developed here. One is called Pashonk, does that ring a bell? And Moyamensing, right? Two prominent avenues, which actually used to be Indian trails. Uh, it's, they're one of the few streets, really, within the city that go on an angle. So they actually mirror where the Indian trails were. Does anybody know what Pashonk and Moyamensing translate into? Pigeon yeah, pigeon dropping, Moyamensing. Translates into pigeon droppings. I'm not kidding you. And I'm assuming uh, that has, has to do with, I know in early records and newspapers of the 18th century, they talk about the skies being blackened with flocks of uh, carrier pigeons and birds, if you can imagine that, uh, back in the early years of the, the country. So I guess they hung out around Moyamensing Avenue. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. That's the only connection I can make. And uh, Pashunk, anybody want to guess what that stands for or translates into? It's not pigeon, nothing to do with uh, dirty things. Uh, not quite, in the valley. So uh, obviously there was a little valley that carried uh, the Native Americans in and out of this area. And it was a good place to, uh, to visit. Uh, so we have pleasant place in the valley, pigeon droppings. <laughs> So those names stuck and are still familiar to most of us today. Uh, so I think that's pretty interesting. When the uh, Swedes had settled here and created this church, you know, initially there was good relations between the Native Americans and the early settlers. Uh, and that was the case too with William Penn when he arrived in the Quakers. Uh, but of course, we know how the story turns out. Things turn sour pretty quickly. Uh, the Native Americans are resettled and they continue to be resettled for a century at least or longer, uh, which is unfortunate. But 